We're talking about documentary films and the craft behind them and what goes into making a successful documentary, an engaging documentary, one that's educational and informative. And the team uh, that we have with us today uh, have, have created some, some pretty fantastic documentaries. So I'm going to ask everyone if they could first introduce themselves and, and tell us a little bit about yourselves. So we'll begin with the director of The Girl Who Wore Freedom, uh, Christian Taylor. Hi, like you said, my name is Christian Taylor. I am the director. I also produced, wrote, and narrated The Girl Who Wore Freedom, uh, but it's certainly not a project I did alone. I have, um, you know, an amazing team. Uh, this is my first film, so I've been in the business about 40 years, but I was an actress, a voiceover, and I did some field producing, so uh, this really was a whole new world for me. All right, and then we have Bill. Hello, Bill. Hi, uh, my name is Bill Ebel. I was the editor for The Girl Who Wore Freedom, and uh, I've been editing uh, in commercials and film and everything for about 25 years, but this is my first documentary as well. All right, and then we have David Patterson. David's had experience uh, writing, producing, directing narratives, and producing documentaries. So if you tell us a little about, about your background. Oh, we just hit up the mute uh, off. Yeah, unmute, unmute. Yeah. And I think David, we can't hear you. <laughs> unmute. See the mute thing? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Uh, hey, there I you go. All right. Hey. That was you. That was your fault. It wasn't my fault, people. Usually it is my fault, but uh, it's not this time. Uh, my name is David Patterson. I started out as an actor for the steady work, uh, then became a playwright for the big money. Uh, and then became a screenwriter for the respect and honor you get from Hollywood execs. Uh, <laughs> and, and then I decided to ditch all that and become a producer as well to get my stuff done. Uh, but also, I've also produced several different um, documentaries. And uh, I can tell you right now that Christian may be a first time filmmaker, but anyone who's seen the film might think it's her 10th or 11th. It, it's oh. quite a wonderful film very well put together um i came on board after she had finished uh, the rough cut and probably is one of the reasons why i wanted to be involved i wanted to hop on a very very nice train so I, <laughs> you know, so I, I i i hopped on midway i didn't say i grabbed the caboose but uh you know she she was already well on her way on some decently built tracks so it's a it's a great film i'm very proud of it and i hope everyone who's on this webinar gets a chance to see it as well and Jeff? Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Kurtnacker, and uh, I was the composer on The Girl Who Wore Freedom. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then we have Johnny Sweet, uh, who is uh, a documentary filmmaker who's with ESPN for many years and made a uh, documentary about Ron Artest, uh, which was on Showtime. And now he has a film called uh, One Day in June, which is screening here at the festival. So I know I've said a few words, but if you want to tell us a bit about, about your background. Uh, sure. Hi, my name is Johnny. Uh, thank you for having me, first and foremost. Uh, yeah, I was at ESPN for about a decade. I uh, was a producer there. Uh, went on to uh, work with uh, other networks, such as TNT, NFL Network. Uh, mostly my experience was in sports uh, and rap music. Um, so we, uh, thanks to the pandemic, uh, all of our projects got either postponed or canceled. And, you know, we had to... Uh, we had to do something to keep our creative juices flowing. So with one day in June, why not go out in the middle of everything and, you know, learn firsthand how, uh, how Black Lives Matter was able to, uh, to impact the rest of the year. So. And Johnny, I believe you uh, were nominated for an Emmy as well for one of your projects. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, uh, we, <laughs> we, yeah, that shocked us. We didn't expect that to happen, but yeah, we were pleasantly surprised when, uh, when that happened with, uh, with the Artest project. Cool. So let me uh, first, and if anybody has any questions, by the way, feel free to put it in the Q&A box. If you have any questions regarding documentary filmmaking uh, or filmmaking in general, feel free to put it in the Q&A box. Uh, so let me start off by asking Christian uh, if you can tell us uh, a bit about uh, The Girl Who Wore Freedom. Yeah, so The Girl Who Wore Freedom is a really unique uh, personal and um, very passionate story. It's a love story, really. Uh, I think that I may be the first filmmaker to go to Normandy and see a love story there. 
It tells the story of what happened at D-Day, the liberation and the celebrations afterwards, but from the perspective of the French. The French lost 20,000 lives in the Battle of Normandy, and they were overcome with grief and sadness. But somehow, over time, that grief morphed into gratitude, and it really shaped their culture, and it shaped how they think about Americans and how they honor our veterans. And when I went there in 2015, I was so blown away by what I had seen that I knew I had never understood the depth of the French gratitude. And I really felt like the rest of America needed to as well. Uh, it was, it's a very unifying story that I think our, our culture really needs right now. It, it shows who America was when she was at her best, when she sacrificed uh, for the good of others. And uh, when she really stood on a wall against evil and said, you know, you will not come any farther. And I saw the positive effects of that 75 years later when I went back and visited as the French teach their children and their grandchildren about the preciousness of freedom and the importance of sacrifice. Great, thank you. And David, you've had uh, quite a bit of experience in the film world, having been in Sundance, having produced and written some studio projects as well. How did uh, the girl who wore freedom end up with you? How did you, how did you discover it? And how did you and Christian connect? Well, it starts out, again, one of my stories, it's all about me. So um, I was reading my college um, magazine and uh, I was trying to read who was in the entertainment business. You know how they say who graduated when and, and uh, if they're in the entertainment business. And there was actually a very large article about Christian and uh, I started reading it. And, Turns out she and I went to school at the exact same time. It's not a big school, and we had never met. Um, uh, I, I was a big partier, so she probably stepped over me at some of the uh, college parties, and so we just never met. But I, you know, I was intrigued by the magazine, and uh, through the magazine, I'm not sure. I can't remember, Christian, if there was an email there, or somehow I was able to track her down, track down her email, and I. It would be. The email was in there. I was desperate to find people to to help me at the time. And really the piece was about trying to find support. And so I put in there my email, my phone number, maybe even, I don't know. But you you did email me and you said, hey, you know, I saw this. The story looks amazing. You said you were going to go into some film festivals and you're still working on your project. Let me know if I can help you in any way. And I think I picked up the phone and called you within minutes. Yes, I think she called me almost immediately saying, okay, what can you do for me? No, I'm joking. She, just, <laughs> she was just very, very excited. And I said, look, I've had films and I think close to 100 film festivals. I sort of know how that works, um, especially for beginning filmmakers. It can be a very terrifying journey. And so I'd be happy to um, offer to send her some money to make sure she could afford to um, apply to festivals. And I and said... I said I said, keep your money. How about you come on board and help me figure out the film festival distribution landscape? And I have to say, that's probably, other than hiring Bill and Jeff, that's the next most important decision I made as a filmmaker. And I want to say to anybody that's watching, uh, David's experience in the industry has been invaluable because he knows so much about you know, not only how a film is produced and made, but also then how to walk it through the film festival path and then how to negotiate with uh, distributors. And he's done that very successfully with us, I might add. You know, we're now in 11 film festivals. We've won a ton of awards and we have a distribution deal in North America. And a lot of that is thanks to David. Okay, I'll take the credit for that. I mean, uh, <laughs> again, it's, it's really uh, the quality of the product. Um, it makes it a lot easier um, to, to help guide it through those directions. It's ha I'm, I'm sure we'll touch on this. It's been rather brutal, uh, the, the COVID film festival circuit, because it's really a, a skeletal uh, remains of what the traditional festival run is. And it's a huge credit to Big Apple uh, and, and other fests that have, have just kept going because uh, we need these venues uh, of entertainment and, and filmmakers need an outlet to show their work. And so for festivals to keep, you know, through this, it's great because there were lots of festivals where they just canceled and kept their application money and other ones that postponed and they said, we'll get back to you Sunday, um, uh, but we're not going to give you your money back. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's been a very tough run. 
And so obviously we love to be in Big Apple. We're, we're not grateful because we know it's a very good film, but we know the, what we're going up against applying to every single film festival out there. Yeah, um, you know, it's great. I mean, you know, the fact that, you know, the, the, the film is out there and, and people have the opportunity to view it. I mean, it's definitely a, a great, great documentary and, and speaks volumes, you know, about the country's history and, uh, you know, congratulations on the film. Uh, Bill, how did you uh, get, how did you get into this picture with Christian and David? Well, I've known Christian for, we keep, we, we, one day we need to do the math, but it's over 20 years. Uh, we used to be neighbors. We went to church together. We've, uh, you know, our kids grew up together. So we've known each other for a long time. And we'd always talked about working together and we had done some really small projects kind of on the periphery together. But um, she, I was working on a feature film in Georgia and I get a call from her uh, that she's doing this project and she needed a trailer and that's how it started. So we had no film, but we needed a trailer so we could raise money. And um, we, uh, she was telling me all these amazing stories of these people who of course I would forget their names almost immediately because they were French and hard to remember. Um, but it was very emotional. And uh, that, hooked me in right away was the just the beautiful stories of uh the way the french would honor our veterans and care for our veterans and you know quite frankly made me feel like you know i was uh, a, a bad american because i did not do near what the french were doing for our veterans um so anyway we got started on a trailer and uh then she talked to me about editing the film and we went from there Ooh, all right. And lastly, Jeff, uh, for the girl who wore freedom, how did you um, end up in this collaboration? Uh, well, Christian was uh, on a podcast. She still is on a, a weekly podcast um, that I had listened to for a few years. And um, I heard her starting to talk about wanting to make this film. And it sounded interesting. But at some point, she kind of put out this call for help, much like the article in her <laughs> college newsletter, uh, a little bit of a call for help saying, hey, I need, I need people who can help make this a reality. And so my wife uh, said, who's also a podcast listener, said, hey, you should contact Christian and see uh, if she needs help from a music standpoint. And I have put out so many emails and cold calls in my life hey, you know, your project looks interesting. You do looking for music or what do you guys do for music? I never hear anything back. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll email her and just see. Um, and so my wife nudged me along and I emailed her and uh, Christian responded back. And she said, I live in Orange County, California. Christian said, hey, I'm in uh, Las Vegas for uh, some trade show. Um, are you able to meet? And I'm like, well, that's like a four hour drive. So I would prefer a phone call. But at the end of the day, uh, I ended up driving out there that afternoon. Uh, it was like a Sunday at two. I drove out there, met her and some of the crew for dinner, and then drove back. So it was like an eight-hour round trip, dinner trip. But um, I was really, I was writing music for video games, and I was really anxious to break into film. And so this was, you know, my ch first chance to really sit down with a filmmaker and, um, and kind of build it from the ground up. Hey, that may that may sound crazy. I just want to say it may sound crazy that he would drive an eight hour round trip like in the middle of the night to interview for a job that he wasn't even getting paid for. That's the other thing. This is a volunteer position. Uh, mm -hmm. And now you're talking to an award winning, you know, composer who won the best original score at the International Sound and Film Music Festival. And so when people are thinking about, you know, doing crazy stuff like that, uh, it can often pay off in spades, and we do hope that will continue to be the case for Jeff. We're super happy to have him on our team. Cool. Thank you. And uh, as the Girl War Freedom, uh, of course, focuses on historical um, subject matter, uh, Johnny's film um, is quite the opposite, focusing on contemporary issues that are relevant today. So, Johnny, if you can tell us a little bit about One Day in June. Oh, you just got to unmute it. Yeah. Sorry, that's uh, my bad. Um, actually, there is a historical element to it. Um, just I grew up in New York City, so um, the cases of you know Amadou Diallo, um, Sean Bell, uh, Eric Garner were 
part of the uh, part of the foreshadowing of the arc of this story because it's Eric Garner's mom who is at the head of or big large. Uh, she's at I wouldn't say the head, but she's up front with the Black Lives Matter movement in New York City, and she's the one who really pushed to get the legislation passed after two and a half weeks of protests in the city. So um, it's a, there's historical context to this present day uh, this present day story arc. Okay, so Christian, let, let me. Uh, are you, you able to hear me? Okay, right? Yep. Okay, so Christian, uh, when you first started um, looking for your, you know, focusing on documentary filmmaking, when you started looking for your team, like what did, what were some of the what were you looking like, looking for in an editor, in a producer, in a music composer? Like what were some of the things that you felt you were looking for in order to bring this project to life and be seen the way it needed to be? Yeah, seen? it was a really um, unique combination of I really wanted high quality, high caliber, skilled people um, like Bill, like Jeff, who'd been in the industry, who really knew what they were doing and had a, a, a passion for storytelling, that were very emotional people. Um, same with my cinematographer, Corey Lillard. I wanted to find those kind of people that had that expertise, but also I was really looking for character, character and a commitment a hard work ethic and a team player, um, you know, mindset about things. And I really felt like, you know, in the past, uh, at, for me, that's the whole package. It's your character. It's how gifted you are at your skills. It's how committed you are at your job. And, um, and really, I wanted people that were ready to take an adventure. I knew that I didn't really know what I was doing. And I needed a lot of help. So I gave my each department a lot of latitude and leeway to bring creative skills to the table and, and have ownership in the project. And so that adventurous spirit also needed to be a part of that. And David, as a producer, you know, for other, other documentary filmmakers who are on here right now trying to get a producer attached to their project, as a producer, what do you look for in a documentary when you decide what, which film you want to get involved with? Well, uh, in this case, um, I, we had another one of my documentaries, uh, Don't Stop Believing, at Big Apple uh, a bunch of years ago. Um, that was, came to me as a pitch. You know, I, I didn't see any footage about it, but I, I was intrigued by the story and I wanted to be a part of it. In this case, uh, after my initial discussion with um, Christian, she sent me the trailer. And uh, I'd say... 30 seconds in, I, I, I was already on board. Um, part of that is because of the quality of the people that she had already put together um, for the presentation of the trailer. And, uh, you know, I just said, you know, this is, everyone knows about war documentaries, but this is a documentary about war that nobody knows about. And so, of course, anything I want to touch, I'd like to think that no one's heard it before. You know, there are a billion documentaries out there, but every documentary in, wants to think that their story has not been told before. And um, sometimes it has. And so it has to be very uh, different than the traditional thematic element. And, uh, and I think actually that's one of the reasons we had maybe a little eye rolling uh, when we do submit to festivals, because they're like, oh, it's another war documentary, you know? Um, and they don't understand, as she said, it's a love story, actually. It's an incredible love story. Um, and like I said, I was, I was intrigued immediately and I reached out to her. I will tell you, all you documentarians listening, sometimes people send me stuff and I watch just a little bit of it and I just say, uh, yeah, this just isn't, isn't, isn't what I'm up for. And I try to let them down as nicely as possible. But when it grabs me, uh, it grabs me, grabs me hard. And so I uh, definitely um, reached out to her immediately. And look, I'm Scottish, so for me to offer even a little bit of money to someone is actually painful. So, you know, for me to offer and to give her some money um, for the festival thing, and God, how relieved I was when she said no, because that never happens. Um, and so she said, I need, I need your, your input. And I'm like, well, that doesn't really cost a lot. Actually, I shouldn't say that either. That's going to ruin me on future jobs. But anyway, uh, it was, you know, I felt, a, I felt a need to be a part of it, I guess, 
and any documentary that I become part of, I, I have a need to be a part of it. And I think that's what most uh, producers will say about uh, things that they're on, a part of. Thank you. And uh, Bill, as an, as an editor, like, how do you go about, well, it's sort of a general question, but you know, you're dealing with interviews, you're dealing with stock footage. What kind of strategies do you, you, know, do you utilize to, to make the story as cohesive and run as smoothly as possible? Well, we had a very uh, roller coaster ride on this film because the majority of the interviews were in French. And uh, Christian speaks a little French. I speak no French. And so uh, we went through a long process of getting translations done and transcriptions done and then, you know, subtitles on the footage so we could get to the story. Because Christian had all the stories in her head from talking to people, but we had to see what we actually had on film or on, you know. And so, uh, so it, we went through a few rounds of translations and refining the translations to get to really what people were saying. And I know it seems like it's a, you know, splitting hairs, but a Google translation of what somebody said and a really, uh, um, close translation of the emotion and what they're telling you is a huge difference. And so when we finally got to that level of translation, all of a sudden these stories started coming to life. And then, you know, then it was, you know, okay, how do we tell this as one big story? Because it was, you know, a bunch of people telling their story um, and then trying to figure out kind of a structure for it and the themes of, um, you know, the initial seeing the, the GIs walking, you know, up in their, through their town on D-Day to uh, people losing, you know, their mother to shrapnel as the Germans were shelling their town. And so we really worked a lot to get uh, the flow of the story right. And then, uh, you know, the archival footage was a whole nother thing that we both learned a lot of lessons <laughs> doing, doing it the wrong way first. Gotcha. And uh, Jeff, as a, what should documentary filmmakers look for when determining their music? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think there's such a range of, of subjects and topics that you can make a documentary about. So um, it's really tough to, to give you a formula of what to look for. But I think what you really need um, is someone who is in touch with that language of music, someone who can take the vision of what the subject is and even what beyond the subject, even what's underneath it. Um, and you're sort of a woodworker trying to make a frame for a masterpiece painting as a composer. So you are the guy that has to sort of kind of under underpin and, and sort of frame out the beauty or the heartbreak or whatever that emotion is that's driving that scene or that storyline. Um, you have to kind of dig into that and find those nuances. But not only that, now the composer has to translate that. And sometimes just a simple piano is perfect. Sometimes it's a guitar, sometimes it's a whole orchestra. And so you really have to be able to take, take that um, emotion and then rework it and translate it into something that is meaningful without overstepping. That's one thing I see a lot of um, in, in film music is just maybe an overuse of it or an overstepping of it where um, it sort of is, starts to outshine um, the actual on-screen action. All right, thanks. Uh, so, Johnny, in, in one day in June, uh, let me ask you, how many, um, how many hats did you have to wear uh, for this project? Well, we had no money for it, so um, I had to be a shooter. I had to rough cut edit it. Um, I had to score it. Uh, I had to write it, so I, did, I had to do those. So. Did you, get, did you get in fights with yourself over any of it, like with the editor or the, the guy who was shooting it, or did you get, all get along? Uh, you know, there's multiple personality disorder that I, uh, you know, developed, you know, during the course of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it was, uh, it, it, it was, when we were, when we were, uh, the one day we went out there to really shoot everything, and when I got everything back, I went over all the footage. Uh, basically, the events of the day cut themselves. Um, and then I just had to go back out and uh, shoot and film uh, other B-roll and certain landmarks in New York City. So like I went back out to the South Bronx, 
uh, for the Amadou Diallo mural uh, for cover there. Um, and then some archive stuff uh, to fill in some blanks uh, to visually cover the arc. Um, and then I had my own footage that I own myself from previous projects. And since a lot of my projects have been uh, New York based, uh, I was able to draw from past we visual weapons that I had also to cover. So, so Johnny, uh, ho hopefully that explains. <laughs> so you really didn't have much of a, a crew. It was pretty, I mean, you were pretty much in many ways doing much of it on, on your own. Uh, well, the, the MVP of the film is actually uh, my partner on this, Ellis Williams, who was the other shooter on this. Uh, reason being was he was able to get uh, close enough access with, uh, with Gwen Carr, uh, Eric Garner's mom, uh, and he was able to get prime positioning during uh, her media event uh, that day. So uh, I, really, he's the X Factor. Uh, he got the uh, most important sound in my eyes. And then he worked with, uh, he, you know, he covered one borough, I covered another. Um, he got amazing sound uh, that was actually better than the stuff I got. So really, he's the one who developed most of the, uh, the audio and visual weapons that were needed in order to make this as, as good as we could make it based on the fact that, uh, again, we had no money. So. <laughs> I actually, um, yeah, I do have more questions for you, but I just want to take a question here. Jacob asks, hi, everyone. As a new filmmaker, I'd like to ask a very broad question. What do you think makes a good documentary and what makes an audience connect with it? So I guess we'll start with Christian, the director, um, then David as the producer, and then maybe Johnny uh, as well. Christian, why don't you go ahead? What makes a good documentary? Yeah, I am an avid consumer of documentaries, and I really think the essence of a good documentary lies, of course, in the story with the characters and the people and the emotion. And, uh, you know, you have to have those at the heart of your documentary. And then I think from there, what, what amplifies what's already there uh, is then the editing, the music, um, the cinematography, of course. Uh, but the story and the characters and the emotion for me are the three most important things. David, as a producer, same question, you know, what makes it for a good documentary, but also from a producing standpoint, what makes it not only good, but also marketable to the public, something people would want to see and hopefully pay to see? No, I mean, that's a very uh, important question, especially for filmmakers that are starting out. If you want to make a short doc, you make a short doc okay which means you know 25 28 minutes once you hit the 30 minute part mark people are already saying what is this you know um and another when you go past that mark um i've always said if it's a doc you better be ken burns and you can make it 120 minutes but i think once you pass the 90 minute mark on a documentary uh, it's tough um and again what we talked about it really has to be interesting uh, one thing that's really important is test audiences uh, for filmmakers before you even go out to festivals. I'm saying grab family, grab friends, you know, really have them look at it. People are pretty honest, even at family. Like, I loved it. It was a little long, you know, because people love to use it. That's like the least, you know, mean thing to say to a filmmaker. You know, I thought it was a little long. And one thing that I've always done when there is a sizable audience for screenings, you sit back, you look for wrist movement and head movement, because that generally means they're looking at their watch. And this is very telling in documentaries and not so much in, in, in regular dramatic works or, or, or features of, uh, you know, live action features, I guess. But people with a documentary, they already have something in their mind ingrain how long a documentary will be. So it really is the wrist turns, the head turns, and the throat clearance. And when you got to check the first time you hear that, if you're in the first five minutes, you're screwed. You know, if you start seeing a wrist turn at uh, 15, 20 minutes, you know, are they doing that knowing it's a short documentary or at, at a long documentary? And, um, you know, when I first saw Christian's film. What was the first thing I said, Christian? I said, it's too long. <laughs> and then when she showed me the next draft, I said, you know, it's, it's, it's too long. And, you know, I, I can be a bully. And, you know, I, I kept telling her that, and a lot of filmmakers have to know this, when you're being judged for festivals, they're judging you 
on the quality, but also on the length. If they have a short documentary section, they're gonna to wanna to be able to cram as many docs into an hour or an hour and a half as they can. If they are gonna want, if you do have a feature doc, they still have to plan out their whole day. So if you come in with a three hour documentary, uh, God bless you and God bless the theater, uh, the film festival that says, let's take on this three hour doc. Um, because time is one of the most important elements, I feel. Uh, well, in all films, but documentaries are really, really judged uh, on, on their length of time uh, according to the content. I did see once, uh, Tribeca premiered uh, Ken Burns' Vietnam documentary. That was the only one I ever saw where it was like three hours long or something. In a film. Yeah, 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 it's Ken Burns. Yeah. <laughs> Ken Burns could fart on a burger and they could just show that for six hours and people would still watch it going, this is a brilliant thing. So the rest of us, you know, that burger fart's going to get us nowhere. So you really have to know that um, it should be a very short fart on a burger if you're starting out. And uh, Johnny, how would you answer Jacob's question? What do you think are the most important elements to make a great doc? Uh, I think everything that, that's been mentioned is on point. I would also say um, uh, authenticity and pace as well. Um, you know, the more truthful your characters are. Uh, I mean, I, I'm a journalist at heart. So the, every, the more everything factually seems accurate with your, your characters telling the story um, as lively as possible, you know, all those ingredients in between. And the film scoring, which, which, which was brought up, uh, actually, uh, no one ever really talks about that because, you know, people think it's just subtle, but actually it's subliminally carrying you from scene to scene and it's vital. Um, so yeah, those ingredients are, are all important. All right. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat box. Let me ask, uh, I'm going to ask Johnny a question and then a similar question to Christian. Um, Johnny, so even though your film is, you know, okay, so it's something that, you know, in society today, it's relevant to our society today, but do you want, do you want it to be timeless or do you want it specifically to be a reflection of sort of society today? Or do you want people to still look at it in 20 years from now and, you know, find it relatable? Uh, I'm hoping it's relatable because, uh, you know, to me, um, this movement, even though it was just in New York City, it's branched out nationwide. And this is a microcosm of how the election changed. So to me, I'm hoping uh, that makes it feel a little more timeless. Uh, also, this has, been, uh, this has been an issue in New York City, uh, really dating back to uh, incidents in Harlem in the 1940s. So uh, to me, there's aspects about it that are timeless within a very short time frame period. So uh, I, I'm hoping that was executed. Uh, if it wasn't, then that's my fault. So. Uh, Christian, the girl wore freedom. Do you want this to be a timeless piece in American history? That was very, very important to me from the beginning. I felt like this was an evergreen story. The French celebrate their liberation every year. They always will. I'm convinced of that. Even in the pandemic, they found a way to reinvent celebrating veterans, even when the veterans couldn't be there and the celebrations were closed and their country was closed. They will continue doing that. And this is a film, I mean, we have people asking us every Veterans Day, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, um, if they can show this film because the message is bigger than just the story of D-Day. It is that we need to remember the sacrifices that were made for our freedom, how precious freedom is, and I do think that is a message that will will never grow old and we always need to hear it. If we don't tell these stories, listen to these stories, they will be forgotten and we will repeat the mistakes of our past. Right. So both, both film <laughs> just one other quick thing, from a marketing selling standpoint, that's huge as well. So we can say when we go into pitch meetings, this is an evergreen story. This is something that's going to go well beyond this moment. And so this is a good investment. You know, if you're pitching up front to have people support you, there's that message. But also if you're selling to a distributor, you're able to say, uh, this is a film that's going to have a good return on your investment. Okay. Thank you. And what, I want to talk about archival footage uh, for any uh, documentary filmmakers watching right now. That could be a challenging thing. So let me ask, uh, well, let me ask Christian first and then maybe Bill as well can, can, can 
discuss this a bit. Archival footage, what were some of the challenges uh, that you dealt with, Christian? And One of the absolute biggest challenges by bar none was this challenge. Uh, and the biggest problem was that I had really no understanding of how much of a challenge it was. Uh, so had I done for my next documentary, I will have an archival producer signed on the in the very beginning who already has all the relationships. Uh, the National Archives is the uh, biggest repository that in the Library of Congress, of course, of many of the archival stuff that we used and uh, having someone that understands how business is done there and how, um, how to get things quickly is key. Uh, we made good relationships with people in Normandy and those museums there, they gave us a lot of stuff. But the National Archives is horribly organized and managed. And so trying to get what you need out of that takes somebody that knows the inner workings of bureaucracy, has had a lot of time in there, may already have their own databases. Um, and it can get very, very expensive. That's the other thing that we did not understand. If you want high quality images to get those are expensive. And then, you know, we had the issue of trying to find archival footage in France. Well, dealing with the INA, which is the France Media House, uh, is incredibly expensive and they do not negotiate. So, um, you know, when you're dealing with international archival stuff, it's challenging. We had to deal with, um, you know, uh, just different photo databases in England. Uh, as well as the International War Museum. And so having somebody that understands how to do those deals, how to find those footage is critical. And Bill, I'll let you talk about that because Bill, you can tell them the big mistake that we made that no one should ever do. Yeah, I mean, certainly not understanding the process was, uh, you know, something that we uh, now know uh, how to you know, go in uh, at the beginning. But part of our problem too was what we had set up as our deadline. So we started uh, together working in, I think it was March, right? Of 2019. And, yeah, March of 2019 and wanted to have a rough cut of the film for D-Day that June. So, you know, we had, you know, what was that? Six to- 10 know, weeks. 10 weeks to get uh, a cut of the film together from zero. And so we were on Google and ripping every picture or video we could off of YouTube, whatever, just to, you know, B-roll our film, thinking, well, we'll figure the rest out later. Well, <laughs> figuring the rest out later is a terrible strategy. Um, and, you know, on some level, it did work for us in terms of getting to D-Day, but uh, going into it next time, we will be you know, doing that in, you know, a more proper way so that we don't paint ourselves into that corner again. Johnny, how about you, archival footage? Did you have any challenges in your project? Uh, archival footage is, on any project is always, uh, is always an, an interesting battle to try and win. Um, I mean, I can tell, on, on the Ron Artest project, the majority of the budget was for uh, licensing archives. So for instance, we had to license the NBA footage. Uh, we had to convince the NBA to let us license uh, the brawl incident in Detroit, which they had never allowed before. So we had to convince them why it was uh, important to have uh, that license. We had to license NCAA footage. We had to license footage from Ron Artest himself, who was not going to give it away for free. No athlete is ever going to give anything away for free. Well, most, a lot of people won't give anything away for free. So that's, that was another negotiation. We had to, you know, we also had to license, I know this is outside of archives, but for that film, we had to license a lot of commercial music. And uh, it took eight months to license all of the commercial music because if you look at the writers and publishers on almost any rap song, there's like four to eight writers on it, plus the publishing rights and, all that other stuff. So if it's something that you can win ahead of time, it'll make your life easier. Uh, if you have relationships with some of these places like a Wazi Digital or, you know, another uh, library such as that, uh, sometimes you can negotiate a better deal. Um, 
But no, it's always uh, it's always a battle. It's always one of the biggest frustrations. And the worst is when you, know, you put a film out and people are like, well, why didn't you use that footage and that footage? And I'm like, well, would you like to give me your checkbook so I can go and get that? Uh, so yeah, uh, the more you can win that ahead of time, the less headaches you know usually you'll have in the end. I want to, I want to throw something in there, John. Um, my documentary, Don't Stop Believing, was about the band Journey. And oh <laughs> so when I came aboard, I asked the, uh, the lead producer, I said, well, where are we with rights? He's like, ah, oh, don't worry about it, man. They, they said we can do the festival rights for, for free. They, they have no problem with that. I'm like, okay, but what's after that? He said, oh, no, no. They said they'll be really cool. So once we finished the festival and we were going to go, we got distribution, our budget I guess I can say this because it's posted somewhere. Our budget went from 250 grand to 750 grand overnight. Hey, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, that's, uh, you know, I, luckily the, you know, the, the, the distributor basically took that on, you know, as part of our advance because it's journey. Obviously it's going to do well, but I yeah. just tell you, I did not become a millionaire um, out of that deal because literally the, once you look at that mountain to climb, as you said, uh, Johnny, that there's a lot of people to get paid. And, and so that money just starts going in this giant spider web away. And uh, you tend to be, usually you want to be on the edge of the spider web, but you want to be in the middle. Hopefully, you know, you get eaten by something. But, uh, you know, that's what a lot of filmmakers don't realize. And it's called, you know, the, the completion costs or you know what a distributor wants at the end if you got to clear out all the licensing rights like i said we went from 250 to three quarters of a million dollars for our budget overnight and had we negotiated that earlier on we could have said well for everything dvd sold you know you guys would get a certain percentage of it or whatever but instead we were all of a sudden digging ourselves out of a very large hole and no one no one wants to do that no, that, that math sounds accurate. Uh, yeah, because with us, the art test project, we got outside of licensing, it cost about 125 grand to shoot, edit, and get done. And then after all the licensing was done, the final bill was about $515,000. Yes. And, th you know, and then, you know, thank God the selling price was, you know, above that. Uh, I can't mention what the selling price is because right. I'll get slapped up. But yeah, that's, you know, so when people are like, why didn't you get this? Why didn't you get that? Again, it's like, well, you got to figure out how to finance that. And, you know, none, you know, we're not Steven Spielberg. We can't just cut stuff left and right. So exactly. yeah, that math makes sense. Yeah. Um, Jeff, in terms of the archival footage, did you have to coordinate with Bill and, and Christian as well in order to figure out how to sort of line up the music with the footage? Like, do you work together on that? Uh, not not so specifically with the archival footage. Um, I think there were, it was definitely maybe a, 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 a tougher part of the film to score, trying to figure out, um, you know, do we play to the footage? Do we play to the voiceover? That, and sometimes, you know, um, the footage might be some really dark images of, of war, um, but what it's what we're conveying is just how bad things were to realize how much you know empathy and how much love the french people have for us so um sometimes it was just trying to figure out what which which of those threads we wanted to pull um in the story but um i didn't have any specific you know uh frustrating well, frustrating stories that these guys had I, I wouldn't say that, Jeff, because if you think back to the Michelle de Valivier footage, we were given the opportunity to tell a very unique story that even Tom Hanks wasn't given. And that was on D-Day, Dick Winters, if you've seen Band of Brothers, took his group of guys in to liberate Braycor Manor. And in doing so, he liberated this man's farm. And there is a terrifying story in the film where a Frenchman was hurt. And I'm not going to give away the best part, but... At one point, we, we really needed to decide, are we going to let this stand on its own without music? Or are we going to put music underneath it? And if so, what was it going to sound like? And that took us a lot to get right. We ended up, you know, I mean, Jeff, you can talk about that process. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, my original thought was to just let the, you know, the archival footage, I think a lot of that stuff is so powerful anyways. I was just going to let it speak on its own. But then we started to play with um, just some underscore and you know just like i said before composers like to do like to overstep so i was like okay you want some tension and some mystery and so i kind of barfed out this 
maybe over dramatic part of a of music that um, you know it gets the point across, but it's a little too syrupy and heavy handed. And so then we started scaling it back, and we found this point where that less is more approach, and we we found a good balance of of kind of sparse tension, um, you know, ticking away at his story. And then it, we found that it really does help you be engaged with that moment. Um, John, can I just go back to the rights discussion that we were talking about before, especially because I know we have some first time filmmakers listening. Uh, one of the things that's been interesting for me in terms of archival footage rights, as well as music rights that Johnny was talking about, um, is that I ended up negotiating the rights for music and so for some of the images and video that we used for the film festival. So I got those rights for the film festival. They were within my budget, um, but they were really like two to five year festival rights. So when we did get this deal with um, this distributor and they looked at our deals, they're now trying to consider, are we gonna want to license these you know, for the next five years? or are we going to have to cut them out? And so I would say you do need to be thinking, you know, along those lines when you start putting material into your uh, pieces, uh, think about what you can own outright and try to get an idea going forward about how, you know, what the worldwide in perpetuity rights might be. We couldn't get those for any of our things. And we only had one song, five or six pictures and some video. And it's still going to be an incredibly expensive proposition. Right. Yeah, years ago, I used to work for Getty Images and documentary filmmakers would license footage. Sometimes it would just be for film festivals. And that wasn't crazy expensive. But then when you got into worldwide distribution or even national domestic distribution, Oh, suddenly it became a whole different story. Yeah. Uh, I just, we, we have just a few minutes left. I just want to jump over to the Q&A box. Uh, Gwendolyn had a question. Gwendolyn said, uh, my background is in the visual arts and curating events and exhibitions, and I just ventured into documentary filmmaking. I'm an avid jazz fan, and I'm embarking on developing a documentary about jazz. I put together a short trailer, not sure what to call it, and I'm wondering if it is okay to submit a short or a trailer to film festivals. Will that be perceived as professional? Any thoughts on this? There are mm -hmm. actual festivals, I believe, that are trailer festivals. Um, that uh, And it's for that purpose. It's for uh, beginning filmmakers to um, show something that they, they want to do. It's other for other filmmakers who are hoping it would uh, attract some potential investors or, or partners, whether it be producers or performers or whatever. So I know that there are trailer festivals out there. That's <laughs> something definitely to look into. Golden Trailers, is that one? Golden, Golden trailer. trailer Awards, yeah. yeah. Um, I will say that we entered the Trailer Film Festival, which has changed its name now, and our distributor watched our film at the Trailer Film Festival, and that is how they reached out to us and where our eventual distribution deal came from. So, yes, there absolutely are trailer festivals, and they're inexpensive, and they're a great way to test your product, you know, in the marketplace. Nice. All right. We just, I just really quick, we just have just a couple minutes. I just want to get this last question. Somebody asked, what amount of editing your documentary rel relies on script and storyboard beforehand? And how much of is just winging it and putting together what makes sense? <laughs> Johnny, why don't you start with that one? <laughs> uh, I hate storyboarding. Um, I usually write out a general synopsis of what I'm trying to accomplish, but after we do interviews um, and we get the authentic stories told from the people who have lived during a certain event or time period. I let those voices write out the script. Uh, that's how I do it. I know that's frowned upon by many, but that's how I get into uh, a best rhythm in constructing a story arc. Um, that's also how I was trained to do it at ESPN. That's how we did it there. And you know, as you get older, you know, you kind of stick to some of the dogmatic stuff that, that you've been taught. So uh, that's how I do it. I, I usually uh, write the script off of the transcripts of all the interviews that, that are done. And then I, I, off that, I'll fill in uh, aspects of the script with B-roll notes and stuff like that. And I'll go out and we'll, uh, you know, attack, attack those angles. So. 
Well, and I will tell you that I ended up, when all was said and done, giving my editor a writing credit. So that should answer your question. But uh, when I first started out, I started out with an outline and I started out with ideas of what I wanted to film and an idea of the story. I did not have a script and I did not storyboard. And um, then when I had our first assembly edit, after one act of it, I saw it was absolutely horrible. Uh, we trashed all of that and started over. And Bill and I, I did write, but we sort of wrote the script while we were going through interviews and putting visuals together. So it was very collaborative that way. I think when I do my next one, I will try to have a more firm outline. I don't think that I will necessarily storyboard, but I do have much clearer ideas about the shots that I want, and I'll be more particular about how to tell the story. Okay. All right, so I have to stop it there, but I wanna thank everyone for being here. I wanna thank uh, Bill and Jeff and our producer, David Patterson, and of course, the directors of these two fantastic documentaries that we are screening at the Big Apple Film Festival. Uh, One Day in June, directed by Johnny Sweet, and The Girl Who Wore Freedom, directed by Christian Taylor. So they're both vir uh, screened virtually. We also do have drive-in screenings as well this weekend taking place in Hillsdale, New Jersey at Denver S. Farms Drive-In Theater. For all the other films, you can certainly check them out online, bigapplefilmfestival.com. Thank you all for being here. And we do have more conferences coming up later and tomorrow as well as Sunday. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to our participants. Thank you all thank for being you. here. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Bye.